was always focused on counterterrorism. When aspiring operators are being screened for selection into Delta Force, a collection of the most elite soldiers in the Army, they have to pass a series of rigorous and challenging tests, including a ruck march that they begin with no announced distance, no announced end time, and no encouragement. If they can complete this grueling ruck march, they will face a selection board and possibly join the unit. If they fall short, they go home. Delta Force was pitched and built to be an American version of Britain's Special Air Service by men like Colonel Charles A. Beckwith, a Special Forces leader who had previously served as an exchange officer to the 22 SAS. Originally stood up in 1977, Delta was always focused on counterterrorism. Unsurprisingly, Beckwith got the nod to lead the unit he had helped pitch. He looked to the SAS itself for methods to winnow out those who might not be resolute at a key moment in battle and embrace their stress event, a superhuman ruck march. It wasn't an insane distance, just 40 miles or 74 kilometers. That's certainly further than most soldiers will ever carry a ruck, but not an eye-watering number. But SAS candidates conducted this training at the end of what were already grueling weeks of training, and on the day of the final march, they were woken up early to start it. But the real mind game was not telling the candidates how far they had to go or how far they had already gone. They were just told to ruck march to a set point that could be miles distant. Then, a cadre member at that point would give them a new point, and this would continue until the candidate had marched the full distance. Beckwith told his superiors that he needed two years to stand up Delta Force, partially because he felt it was necessary to incorporate this and other elements of SAS selection and training into the pipeline, meaning that he would need to recruit hundreds of candidates just to get a few dozen final operators. President Jimmy Carter wanted a new anti-terrorism unit and senior army brass were initially loath to wait two years to give it to him. According to his book, Delta Force, a memoir by the founder of the military's most secretive special operations, Beckwith had to fight tooth and nail to get enough candidates and time for training, but he still refused to relax the standards. Beckwith successfully argued that to make a unit as capable or better than the SAS, the Army would have to fill it with men as tough or better. This couldn't just be men great at shooting or land navigation or even ruck marching. It had to be those people who would keep pushing, even when it was clearly time to quit. To make his argument, he pointed to cases where capable men had failed to take appropriate action because, as Beckwith saw it, their resolve had failed. He pointed to the 1972 Olympics in Munich where great German marksmen failed to take out hostage takers early in the terror attack because they simply didn't pull the trigger. Beckwith needed guys who could pull the trigger. He knew that the SAS process delivered that, and he didn't want to risk a change from the SAS mold that might leave Delta with people too reluctant to get the job done during a fight. And so the long walk was born into Army parlance. This is that final ruck march of selection. It's 40 miles long. It's conducted on the last day of training when candidates are already physically and mentally completely exhausted. The ruck sacks weigh 70 pounds. Oh, 
and there is an unpublished time limit of 20 hours. And candidates can't march together, each get their own points and have to walk to them alone. And like in the SAS version, they don't actually ever know the full course, only their next point. Finally, while the first classes conducted the long walk at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, later iterations had to conduct their exercise in the mountains of West Virginia, adding to the pain and exhaustion. Even men like future Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, who came to the course after the existence and general distance of the long walk were known, talked about how mentally challenging the uncertainty would be. He lost 15 pounds in the tough training that led to the march, and then he struggled on the actual event. In his book, Never Surrender, A Soldier's Journey to the Crossroads of Faith and Freedom, Boykin says that he was exhausted by the eight-hour mark. Having started before dawn, he would still have to walk deep into the night with his heavy ruck to be successful, praying that every point was his last. But the next point wasn't his last, nor was the one after that, or the one after that. The cadre assigning the points cannot cheerlead for the candidate, nor can they tell the candidate if they're doing well or if they're marching too fast. Either the candidate pushes themselves to extreme physical and mental limits and succeeds without help or encouragement, or they don't. In Boykin's class of 109, only about 25 people even made it to the long walk, and plenty more washed out during that test. Freezing in the weather and exhausted from the weight, terrain, and distance, Boykin did make it to the end of the course, but interestingly, even completing the prior training and long walk does not guarantee a slot in Delta. Instead, soldiers still have to pass a selection board, so some people train for months or years, are marched to exhaustion every day for a month during training, have to complete the long walk, and then they get turned away by the board, are not admitted, and don't become capital O operators. Delta Force has undoubtedly made America more lethal and more flexible. When it comes to missions, but there are strict standards that ensure that only the most fit soldiers can compete in this space, and the long walk forces everyone but the most tenacious out.